guys. Glad to see you here today. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're going to be in Romans chapter 5 today as we uh, continue to make progress through our study on the book of Romans. Of course, Paul has uh, in this letter been giving us the good news. I mean, that's in a nutshell, that's what the book of Romans and and really the entire Bible is about is the good news of Jesus. And what Paul did last week, the way that I kind of look at uh, the first part of chapter five is that Paul sort of bursts out into praise. Right? He, he's explaining the gospel, and, and it's almost like he can't contain his excitement. And so he just bursts out into praise, and, and he tells us to rejoice. In fact, he tells us to rejoice in three things. He says to rejoice in hope, to rejoice in suffering, and ultimately we rejoice in God because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And so uh, today, what we're going to look at in the second half of chapter five, Paul kind of, he almost regains his composure, right, collects himself again, and he's going to continue to uh, explain to us the good news of Jesus, because believe it or not, this thing just gets better and better. Really, Paul's just barely scratched the surface, kind of shown us the tip of the iceberg, but there's so much more that he wants to show us about this good news. And so we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Romans chapter 5. We're going to pick it up in verse 12 and we'll read through the end of chapter 5 together. And then, of course, as always, we'll we'll kind of break it down and pick it apart and 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 look at what Paul is trying to say to us this morning. So Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 12, this is what Paul writes. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, For if many died through one man's trespasses, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, Grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, up to this point in Paul's letter to the Romans, Paul has been mostly on the ground, sort of exploring how uh, the gospel saves and justifies each one of us personally and individually. Um, So in the first four chapters of Romans, he's been uh, just exploring kind of our personal justification, how Jesus justifies us, how he's saved us, how he's taken our punishment that we might receive a part in, that he's uh, not only completely forgiven our debt, but he's deposited to our account this enormous wealth of righteousness. So that's what Paul's been dealing with so far in in the first four chapters of his letter. He's sort of been kind of on the ground exploring how we are each personally and individually saved. But what Paul's doing here in the second half of chapter five, he's sort of giving us a sweeping aerial view of God's epic plan of salvation. He's granting us this sort of grand perspective on God's plan of salvation, showing us uh, all of human history from Adam up until Jesus. And Paul's uh, primary point that I I think he's wanting to show us here is, is something that he's already hinted at a couple of times in this letter. We've talked about it a, a couple of times. And really this idea that Jesus is God's 
one and only plan of salvation. That God's one and only plan of salvation from the very beginning has always been his one and only son, Jesus. Right? That Jesus, the way that I've said it, is that Jesus wasn't plan B. Right? And, and this idea that I think a lot of Christians have, that, that the Old Testament was plan A, and that was kind of a disaster. So, so God brought in the New Testament, which is plan B, right? That the law was plan A and that didn't really work out. So Jesus was plan B. And what Paul wants us to understand, especially in this section, is that Jesus wasn't plan B. He was always God's one and only plan of salvation from the be very beginning. And so Paul's been uh, mostly on the ground so far, just kind of exploring our, our personal individual justification. But here he's giving us a sweeping aerial view, granting us a, a grand perspective on God's epic plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. Now also up to this point in Paul's letter to the Romans, he's been using primarily legal language. And, and I don't know if you've noticed that, but, but he's in the first four chapters, it, it's, it's been a lot of kind of legal language or legal jargon that he's been using to explain this personal justification with Jesus. In fact, we spent four weeks looking at his legal prosecution, right? He essentially puts all of humanity on trial. And, and the point that he's trying to make is that every single one of us from the most rebellious to the most religious and everyone in between stands guilty before God, right? That one day, every single one of us that the Bible makes very clear that we will all stand before God and give an account and that every single one of us on our own outside of Jesus will stand guilty. We are all unrighteous. And so Paul's made that very clear, but then he's given us the good news that, that Jesus, he took our punishment that we might receive a pardon, right? That through the cross, he takes our place that we might receive justification, that we might be forgiven, that the, the debt might be forgiven. And not only that, not, again, not only has Jesus paid the debt in full, but he's deposited to our account this enormous wealth of righteousness. So that, that's the good news that Paul's given us. And, and he's used a lot of legal language. But today I want us to kind of look at this from a slightly different perspective. Since Paul's giving us a, a different, uh, grander perspective of the gospel, I want to look at uh, the gospel uh, through, through a little different point of view. And instead of using legal language today, I want to use some medical terminology to, to kind of explain the gospel and explain what Paul is talking about. So I've broken this text into three points. And, and so these are my three points of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about about the infection. And then second, we'll talk about the inoculation. And then third, we'll talk about the injection. So that's my outline today. So first, let's talk about the infection, the infection of sin. This is what Paul says again in verse 12. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all Send. What Paul does here is he, he takes us all the way back to the very beginning. Again, he's giving us a sweeping aerial view of human history, showing us God's epic plan of salvation. And he takes us all the way back to the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. And he's wanting to show us that this sin problem that we have all began with one man. Right? You could trace it all the way back to Adam in the garden in his rebellion. And what we find out is that this sin problem began with Adam and like an infectious disease, it has spread to all humanity. That every single one of us are born in what Paul's gonna even get into a little bit later in this series, that we are all born with this sinful nature, right? We're, we're all born with, with this sort of infectious sin disease. In fact, it, it doesn't take long to even see this manifesting in newborn children, right? And that cute little bundle of joy, so cute and innocent, but it, it doesn't take long before their sin nature starts showing itself, right? And their rebellion and their selfishness. It, it's just, it's like we, it, it doesn't matter how perfectly you raise a child. The, the, we all have this bent towards rebellion, this bent towards selfishness. And, 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 it, and this is what Paul's trying to show us is you can trace this all the way back to one man in the very beginning and, and like an infectious disease, it's infected the heart of all of us. Right? This is why Paul also says this in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter two, verse one and two, Paul writes, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, 
the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience. Right, Paul, Paul in Ephesians, he even points this out, that you outside of Christ are dead in your sins. Right, so P Paul, Paul's trying to make something very clear here. He wants us to understand that the bad news is a lot worse than maybe we ever thought. Because the bad news is that we're not just guilty before God, but we're actually dead in our sins. Right, the, the, again, he, up to this point, he's been using a lot of legal jargon that we're guilty before God, that we're, that we're recipients of God's wrath, that we're all going to stand before the judge, right? He's been using kind of that language, but Paul here, he's like, look, it's, it's actually a lot worse than that. You're not just guilty before God, you're actually dead in your sins. But of course, the good news is a lot better than maybe we ever imagined, because the good news is that we're not just justified, but we are raised to life in Christ Jesus. And that's the good news of the, and this is the epic plan of salvation, the grand perspective Paul's trying to show us here is that, that you're not just guilty, but you're actually dead. And the good news is that you're not just justified, you're raised to life in Christ Jesus. Jesus raises us to life. He makes us new, brand new creations. You, you see, and, and this is really important for us to understand, and really my entire sermon today, just in a single sentence, if you hear nothing else today, hear this, and, and I've said this before, that the gospel isn't merely about making bad people good, but rather the gospel is about making dead people live. Right? And that's the hope of the gospel. Because you see, if you, if you understand the gospel, as simply, we are bad, guilty sinners, and, and we need to correct our moral behavior. And that's ultimately what Jesus came to do, right? Jesus came to make us good, moral Christians that follow the rules. You, if, if that's your understanding of the gospel, you've completely limited the beauty and the hope of the gospel because the gospel isn't about making bad people good. It's actually about making dead people live. Right? And this is what Paul's trying to get us to understand here. Is, hey, hey, look, all, you can trace this all the way back to Adam in the beginning and see that, that sin it is this infectious disease that has infected every single one of us that brings death to all. Right? And in fact, you, you, the Bible even talks about, and Paul will kind of talk about this a little bit later as well, this, this idea that, that, that sin doesn't just affect us individually. It actually affects all of creation. Right? And, the, and the death that sin brings, it, it's, it's infected all of creation. It, and, and you even see in the Garden of Eden that, that, that sin didn't just bring a spiritual death, it actually brought physical death. And, and that Jesus, what he ultimately came to do is bring resurrection life, make all things new. The book of Revelation is, is the story coming full, full circle with the new heavens and the new earth. God wanting to make all things new. God wanting to bring life into all that has, has been wrought with death and decay as a result of sin. This is the epic scope of salvation. It's not just personal justification. It's not just personal salvation, but it's God making all things new. God making new creations. God breathing to life what, what, what was once dead. This is why Paul, he goes on to say back in Romans chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, he says, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who were who sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Paul's point here, and this is really important, is that, that, that our sin problem existed before the law ever existed. And in fact, hundreds of years before the law was ever given, hundreds of years before Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments, the law was already a problem that humanity dealt with. And so Paul's point here is that, that sin isn't simply a result of breaking the law. And again, this is really important. If we wanna understand the gospel and we wanna understand what Jesus is up to, is we need to understand that sin is not simply a result of breaking the law. And I think, again, a lot of people kind of have this idea that, that God gave us his rule book, here's my rules, and if you break my rules, that's called sin. You're a bad person and you clean up your act. 
That, that's kind of how people often see the Christian faith. But the reality is that what Paul's pointing out here is, hey, look, this sin problem, which traces all the way back to Adam in the very beginning, it, 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 it existed long before the law was ever given. So again, Paul's trying to point out here is that this sin issue that we deal with is not simply just the result of us breaking rules because this was a problem before there ever even were any rules to break. This sin problem that we face, it's an infectious disease. It's like a contagious virus that has spread to all of us and it brings death and destruction to everything it touches. And this is what Jesus is trying to reverse. He's not simply here to make bad people good. He's here to make dead people live. He's here to make new creations, all things new. This is the hope we have in Jesus. Now I'm getting a little ahead of myself, of course. So, so, so the question is, why was the law given? Was the law the solution to the problem? Right? If, if sin um, existed before the law, then, then does that mean that God brought the law kind of as a, a solution to the problem. Well, to answer that, we got to look at my second point today. So we've talked about the infection, right? This, the infection of sin. But now I want to talk about the inoculation, the, inoc the, the cure. Uh, and so look what Paul goes on to say, Romans chapter 5, verse 15 through 17. He says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Paul here, he compares and contrasts Adam and Jesus. Uh, in fact, in typical Pauline fashion, he, he just repeats himself a lot. He, he's basically saying the same thing like several different times because he wants us to see the, the contrast between Adam and Jesus and, and showing us that, that sin came through Adam, but, but forgiveness and life comes through Jesus. In fact, he basically says two things here. He says that Adam brought condemnation, but Jesus brings justification. Right, and that's the summary of everything Paul said in the first four chapters, right? That Adam brings condemnation, that every one of us stand condemned before God, but Jesus brings our justification. But Paul points out another thing here, that Adam brought death, but Jesus brings life, right? That through Adam, again, that the sin problem is not just that we disobeyed the rules, but the sin problem is that each one of us are infected with a deadly contagious disease that Adam brought death, but Jesus brings life. Another way to put it is that Adam brought the disease, but Jesus brought the cure. Now, again, of course, the question is, well, why then the law? Right? Again, I mean, if it, what, what was the purpose of the law? I mean, we've talked about that a little bit in this series, but, but Paul, he answers this question in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. He says this, why then the law? I mean, that's the question we're asking. Right? I mean, that's it's a good question, Paul. So why then the law? Well, this is what he says. The law was added because of transgression. So, so again, Paul, what he says in Romans is that the, the sin problem, transgressions, uh, this problem that we have existed before the law was ever given, right? And so, so why then was the law given? Well, Paul says the law was given because of transgression. So is Paul saying that the law was a response to like fix the problem? Well, that's not what he says because look what he goes on to say. The law was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. That, that phrase that Paul says that, that it was given until the offspring should come to whom the promise has, had been made. That, uh, of course, is referring to Jesus um, if you go back to Abraham, and we've talked about Abraham in this series already, that, that God came to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12 and, and t told him, I I'm gonna, you, your descendants are going to become a great nation, and through this nation, this offspring will come. This one will come that will bring salvation to 
the world. What Paul's saying in Galatians here is that, that the law was given as a response to sin, not to be the solution, but rather to point to the solution, to, to point us to the one to whom the promise had been made, Jesus, who would bring justification, salvation, and life to us all. I've said it this way before in this series already, is that, that the law is simply a diagnostic tool. It's like an MRI machine. Right? So if you're sick, you can go lay in an MRI machine for days. It's not going to do anything because an MRI machine was never meant to bring any sort of cure. It's simply a diagnostic tool to reveal what the problem actually is. And that's exactly what the law was given. It was given to simply reveal how deep this problem goes and to show us here's God's standard. And no matter what, we'll never be able to live up to it on our own. It was simply to expose how sick our hearts really are are and to point us to the cure, which is, of course, Jesus, the one who brings life, the one who brings resurrection, the one who brings the cure. So this is why Paul, back in Romans chapter 5, he goes on to say in verse 18 and 19, he says, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. I love this verse because what Paul is saying is that, that just as one man's sin, right, we, we can trace this sin disease that we're all infected with, this death and decay that's, that's affected us all. We can trace it all back to one man. And just as through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, just the same through one man's obedience, many will be made righteous, right? So, so in other words, Paul's saying the cure is Jesus and it's his obedience to the law, not our own, right? Through one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And guess what? That one man isn't you, right? And it's not me, right? Paul, Paul says, look, through one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Through one man's obedience to the law, G Jesus obeyed the law. He fulfilled it entirely. And it's through his obedience that we find life, that we find justification, that we find the cure to this sin sick disease of our hearts. Right? Paul's already made this very clear in this letter is that it doesn't matter how well you obey the law, it's never enough. And, and what he's trying to show us here, what he's trying to expose is that this sin problem goes way deeper than we thought. Because it's not just a matter of breaking the rules. Because if that was the case, if Jesus came to make bad people good, then maybe we could do it on our own. And if sin was merely a result of breaking the rules, then all we have to do is obey the rules. And Paul's trying to show us that this goes much deeper. It's a, it's a disease of the heart that no one can cure. We need Jesus who has obeyed the law, fulfilled it completely and imparts to us his righteousness. So this brings me to my third and final point this morning, which is the injection. All right, so, so if we have the cure, we, we need to, of course, receive the cure, right? If you go to the doctor and he says, okay, well, here's, here's your problem. Here's the cure I have. You, you, you've got to swallow that pill, right? You have to receive that injection. You, you have to actually receive the cure for it to do any good. So, so my question here this morning was, well, how do we receive this cure, Jesus? Well, well, Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, he wraps up this section by saying this, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We, we receive the injection. We receive this cure by grace through faith, faith alone. And Paul's point here is that there's plenty of it to go around, right? One of my favorite verses is what we just read here, that, that where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. And the way that I've explained it many times is that what Paul's saying here is that you can't out -sin the grace of God, right? And of course, I always like to add the caveat that this isn't a challenge to be accepted, 
right? So, some of you are like, challenge accepted. Let's put this to the test, right? And Paul, Paul's not issuing a challenge here, but he is saying, look, where grace and uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. You, you sin and God's like, well, I, I, I see your sin and I, I match it with even more grace, right? This is just how the grace of God works. It never runs dry. The Bible says his mercies are new every single morning. Just as last night when you went to bed, I'm sure you plugged your phone in to charge. It's like God plugs his mercies in every night to charge up. You, you, yesterday, you might have ran that battery dry, but, but God plugged it in. He recharged those batteries. This morning, he had fresh new mercies for you. This is the good news of Jesus, is that, is that all we have to do is receive this cure through grace by faith, and there's always plenty to go around. Uh, you can't out sin the grace of God. You can't deplete his mercies. You, you can't run the cure dry. There, there's plenty of it. Right? We just receive it by faith alone. I, I want to get ready to wind down this sermon by talking about a man named James Harrison. He's also known as the man with the golden arm. I don't know if you've heard of James Harrison. He's an Australian um, and he holds the Guinness Book world record of, of donating the most amount of blood by a single individual. Uh, you see, James Harrison, when he was 14 years old, he was very sick uh, and he had to go to the hospital. Um, and long story short, they, they ha I don't know what was the matter, but they had to like remove part of his lung and, and, and it, was, it was really bad. And as a result, he, he received a lot of blood. Um, and, and of course, he, he got better and, and um, they released him. And, and, and he always felt like, I want to give back uh, because he received just a crazy amount of blood just to keep him alive. So he said, as soon as I turn 18, I'm going to start donating blood because I want to give back. So uh, when he, as soon as he turned 18, he went and donated blood and, and he went uh, all the time, as, as often as they would let him, he would go and donate blood because he, he just wanted to give back. Um, well, in the process, at some point, I, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but at, at some point they discovered that his blood has natural antibodies that cure uh, this disease uh, that would uh, infect babies and infants. This, this, this disease that, that would, uh, like the, the baby's blood would essentially attack itself and they would die. Uh, but James Harrison's blood uh, carried just natural antibodies that, that kind of counteracted that. Uh, and so they started giving his blood to these babies. And, and, and as a result, so he, as I said, for over 60 years, he donated blood. Uh, when he turned 80, he, he had to stop. The, 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 in Australia, the legal cutoff age, you can't donate blood past 80, I guess. So he had to retire his blood, unfortunately. But, but for 60 years, he donated blood a record of 1,172 times, uh, saving an estimated of 2.4 million babies with his own blood. And I, I encourage you to look up his story. It's fascinating. You will have to put in Google search James Harrison blood or something like that because if you just put in James Harrison, all you're going to find is stuff about a football player. Because <laughs> apparently throwing a ball around is far more fame worthy than saving 2.4 million lives. But I digress. <laughs> right? James Harrison, the man with the golden arm. Right, I, you probably know where I'm going with this, right? But, but this is Jesus. Is, he's the man with the golden arm and, and his blood never runs dry, right? James Harrison might have had to retire his blood, but Jesus' blood never runs dry. There's life in his blood. The cure is in his blood. It's not our obedience to the law. It's not being a better person. It's simply receiving that spiritual blood transfusion, receiving Jesus' blood blood and being raised to life. This is the hope we have in Jesus. See, the gospel isn't about making bad people good. It's not about making bad people good, right? Sin isn't simply a result of breaking the law. Sin is a deadly disease that we can't cure on our own. But the good news is that the gospel is about making dead people live. You and I were dead in our trespasses, but Jesus raised us to life 
and he made us new creations. And I want to wrap up throwing out a couple of verses here. This is first is in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Right? If you are in Christ Jesus, you're not simply a better moral person. You are a new creation. Right? Je- Jesus has raised you to life. He's, he's made you a brand new creation. You're not a, you're not a modified creation. You're not a refurbished creation. Right? You are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. You were once dead in your sins. Jesus has raised you to life. He's, he's filled you with his life-giving blood. He's made you a new creation. And then Paul says this in Galatians 6 verse 15. He says, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And we've already talked way too much in this series about circumcision, so I won't get into it again. Right? But, but this is Paul's point, right? Because the, the, the big debate in the first century church was, was circumcision versus uncircumcision, right? That these rituals, like do, do, we, are, do we have to do these sort of rituals? Do we have to obey these? Do we have to observe these? That was the big debate. And Paul's point here is like that, none of that matters. What counts is a new creation, right? Jesus didn't come to give us more rituals and to give us more rules and to make us good moral people. He came to make us new creations because we were dead in our sins and he raised us to life with his life-giving blood. He's made us new creations in him. We we were not simply morally bad. We were spiritually dead. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus raised us to life. What Jesus came to do is make right all that we made wrong. And we don't, we don't do that simply by our own efforts and our own moral good works. We do it simply by receiving that injection, receiving that blood transfusion, receiving the cure and his life-giving blood, letting him raise us to life and walk in that. So let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you, that you have raised us to life this morning. We can rejoice in that. God, your gospel isn't just about making bad people good. You're, you're not here just to correct our behavior. You're, you're not here, you're, you're here to raise us to life, to make us new creations. And we wanna rejoice in that this morning. God, forgive us for trying to on repeat, just do it on our own, do it in our own efforts, do it in our own strength. But God, let us just simply rest in what you've already done. Receive that blood transfusion. be raised to life, be made new creations, walk in that victory this morning. And God, we just rest in it as always. We thank you and we rejoice. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for checking out this message from the Verb Church. We pray that it was a blessing to you in your journey of following Jesus. If you want to find more sermons or just more information about the Verb Church, go to our website at theverb.church. Again, thank you for checking out this message. We'll see you again next week.